Yeah, and there's really cool research that shows that our appetite is driven by the amount of calories we burn. So there is a tight relationship between hunger and drive to eat and exercise. We know that. But often people try to reward themselves with food after they exercise. And I'm so glad we're getting into this now because that's the next piece, right, of tracking, right, is tracking of physical activity and how do we develop an exercise component to our wellness plan that is beneficial for, for the journey of weight loss. So what we do is we recommend the American Physical Activity Guidelines for adults, right? And the, that suggests that adults should be exercising about 150 minutes per week in what we term moderate intensity physical activity. And that's physical activity that you can do where you might be a little bit out of breath, but you can still speak to someone fairly comfortably while you're, while you're exercising. So that's the recommendation that we give. Now, you'll see that there's all kinds of recommendations in terms of steps, right? So there's this recommendation of about 10,000 steps per day. And that came about because that is equivalent to about 30 minutes of walking on the treadmill or walking outside. It's about 30 minutes of ambulatory or moving activity. So if I did 10,000 steps a day for five days of the week, right, then I get my 150 minutes. So that's kind of where that came from. But what's happened is we've given birth to these wearables, right, that are now super fancy it used to just be a pedometer where we could simply just track our steps and that's really, really great. And we'll talk about that in a minute to now these wearables have gotten so fancy that they have algorithms in them that can estimate the amount of calories that you're burning. So they say, right, in the, in the activity and throughout the day. So what people do is they start their wearable before an exercise bout and they'll end their wearable at the end of the exercise bout and it will tell them um, a number of calories that they've burned during their activity. So then people will try to estimate then how many calories that they can go off and eat and reward themselves because they've gotten the okay from their wearable. And this is a big problem in weight management, to be honest, and we can talk about the reasons why. So the first thing is that the number of calories that are estimated by the wearables, um, the equation is there's one for men and one for women, and it's dependent on your weight that you enter yourself and your height that you enter yourself. It's usually not dependent on any more information than that. And the research shows that these devices are really accurate at measuring your heart rate because often they do that at the same time, but they're not accurate at measuring somebody's calories when they're standing still or when they're exercising. None of the wearables are valid for estimating calories. So take that into consideration. There are some that also measure temperature at the same time as heart rate. Those ones do a much better job, but they're quite out of people's price range. They're not sort of the most common ones that you would see around. So I would encourage people just to interpret those information with caution. And they are valid for steps. And so when we're thinking about physical activity for weight management, I think that the message should be to be physically active. Let's achieve the physical activity recommendations for Americans, 150 minutes of per week, roughly 30 minutes at a time if we can, but even 10 minute bouts is perfect. And let's just use steps as our gauge, right? Let's just go with steps because we know that these devices can measure steps and we're not gonna care about the calories because we know our body is gonna buffer them because it's gonna stimulate me to eat a little more, but I'm not gonna pay attention to how many calories. It tells me that I've burned because I'm not gonna reward myself with the extra scoop of ice cream or the donut all the way home or you know, whatever the case may be. So we don't use those. We we actually don't like them at all. Dr. Redman, you're blowing people's minds right now. <laughs> There's so many people out there that are like, wait, what? That's not accurate? Like, I just, I can imagine. Because I when you said it the first time for me, I was like, oh, I did not know that. So that's so interesting. 
Um, you talk about rewards. So if someone's not going to reward themselves with a nice scoop of ice cream or um, maybe a little cup of custard, then what are some other alternatives for rewards as we start to um, lose that weight and, or maintain our weight for that matter? We all need reward. I mean, let's, <laughs> we do. I mean, we do. This is a token economy, right? I, You know, let's just think about the tooth fairy. <laughs> Starts young. <laughs> Right? No, it's a token economy. It really is. And so we need to have rewards, but we need to find other ways to have re to be rewarded. And it's like last time when we talked about social support, right? It's making sure that our loved ones, colleagues, and, and, and family members aren't trying to reward our efforts with sweets and things that are our triggers, right? <laughs> so we need to find out what those other um, motivating factors are. It can be Food. It can be, but maybe it's going to be to spoil yourself once a month with a dinner out somewhere. You know, we should be trying to think about rewards in more of a long-term range than a short, a short-term one. So often for people, the reward is a vacation that's at the end, right, of their journey, their behavior change journey. For some people, it's a wedding, right? Yeah. So there's a dress, and for some people, it might be a new pair of shoes. It could be, you know, some fancy earphones that you're going to get so that, you know, when you hit some weight milestone that you're going to be able to do a different kind of exercise. So it's going to be a different token for each person, but rewards are really important. And as a coach, you should try to help people identify with what those rewards should be for each of your, your people. Yeah. Very important. But I want to get back to something that we're talking about with physical activity. Um, you know, and why Why can't you lose the same amount of weight when you exercise as the sole approach compared to, to diet? And we've actually published several papers on this and we've done some research studies to try to understand it, right? So um, I'll give you an example. So we did a study here at Pennington and it was only a few years ago now. It was called the E-Mechanic Trial, in case anyone wants to look it up, E-Mechanic. And you can go on clinicaltrials.gov to see research studies, by the way. So it was to examine the mechanisms of weight compensation with physical activity or exercise. So basically, they had about 198 people in the study. And they were assigned to three different groups. One group didn't get any exercise. And then two groups got exercise. One got exercise that we called the high dose. So their exercise was, they had to burn in exercise 20 calories per kilo of their body weight per week. So let's just say you're 220 pounds, that would be 100 kilos times 20. So that person would burn 2,000 calories per week here at the center on the treadmill or on the bike or on the elliptical, all supervised for 24 weeks. That's high dose. And that is the amount of exercise that you would need to lose weight. The second group, exercise group, they burned eight calories, so slightly less than half, eight calories per kilo of their weight per week. So that group, instead of burning 2,000, was burning 800 calories per week in exercise. Again, 24 weeks. And that is the amount of weight that, uh, excuse me, that's the amount of exercise that you would need just to maintain, to get health benefits, no weight benefits. So they did it, these 198 people, 24 weeks in the study. So what we did was based on knowing that they were burning 2000 calories a week or 800 calories a week, if they didn't change their diet, we could estimate how many kilos or pounds of weight that they should lose by the end, right? So the group that was burning 2,000 calories a week extra in exercise, they only lost half the amount of weight that was expected based on the amount of calories that they were burning. Wow. And the reason for that is that they were compensating by eating more mm -hmm. food. Yeah. So why doesn't, that's one of the reasons why people don't lose weight on an exercise program alone. But the other reason is just based on basic physiology. So we're going to have a little physiology lesson for a minute. And we're going to talk about how calories are burned over a 24 hour period. So I wish I had um, a box, but I'm going to hold up the thing. Let's just say 
this right here is 100% of all the calories that we burn in 24-hour periods. This is called total daily energy expenditure, the number of calories that we expend in 24 hours. Now, 60% of all the calories you burn every day, that's called your resting metabolic rate. If you, um, Aaron and Lauren, were to just come and lay in the bed for the whole day, you're still going to burn calories. So these are the amount of calories that your body needs just to sustain its life, to beat the heart, to pump the blood, to think, to sweat, to produce urine, right? All of these things is your resting metabolic rate. That's two thirds of all the calories that you need or to burn every day. 10% more is the amount of energy that it takes to eat, chew, and digest your food or your meals. That's only 10% of all the calories that you eat every day. The last part, right? So now I have 30% only is physical activity. Calories burn in physical activity. Now, for most people in America, physical activity doesn't involve any structured exercise. It doesn't involve an exercise class. It doesn't involve going with a trainer. It doesn't involve walking for 30 minutes a day. For most people, we're sedentary. So for most people, these, this 30% of physical activity calories is sedentary activity. It's sitting at the computer typing. It's you know being on your tablet. It's maybe walking from your home to your car. It might be just wandering around the grocery store. For most people, there's no intensity of exercise here. So why doesn't physical activity burn calories? Because it's only 30% of all the calories that you burn in any given day. That's it. So this doesn't change. This is set, right? This is determined by whether you're male or female. It's determined by your age. It's determined actually whether you're African-American or white or Asian descent. So there's some racial component here doesn't change 10% from food and only 30% from physical activity. So physical activity is more important for its health benefits for sure than it is for its impact on um, moving the needle on, on body weight. So that's the physiology lesson in that. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> yeah. But tracking, we should still track, but we're going to track diet because we know that that's going to give us the biggest bang for our buck. We, we need to track weight, but we need to track weight alongside the tracking of diet because then we can troubleshoot, like Aaron was talking about earlier, we can build self-efficacy to know where we're on track. And we want to track physical activity because we know it's so important for our health, even without benefits to weight. And again, it, it contributes so much to sleep quality and it contributes so much to quality of life that we need to be tracking physical activity as well and having a plan that gets people from, you know, two to 3,000 steps per day. And I know that doesn't sound like many, but that's the majority of people to 10,000 is a really a, also a big accomplishment that we should try to coach people to do. It sounds like to me, like, you know, activity and exercise is great for a lot of reasons for health benefits. Mm -hmm. um, and it can be, it can be a part of the story if your if your um, if your goal is weight management, but it should not be the main driver in your weight management program. Is that correct? Absolutely, one hundred percent correct. So, as I said, you know, clinically we provide the recommendations and we do some soft coaching, but it, it's not the focus. Okay, it's not the focus. Yeah, and so then you know we've talked about what do we change in the diet? And we just talked about the importance of, you know, making sure that we're tailoring our coaching to meet the needs, you know, of the people we're working with. That's really important because we know that a calorie is a calorie when it comes to weight management and the tackling someone's problem areas first is the best approach. But, you know, when we, when we, are able to tackle that main problem area, then we've got to come back and think about the next thing that we can improve in the diet. Because overall, we want a more holistic, healthy diet. And if we think about the dietary guidelines for Americans, you know, 
it's it's pretty smart now the way they've changed it. You know, we went from the food pyramid to my plate, and my plate's still there, but now the recommendations are so much more simple and feasible because it says that we want to adopt a healthy eating plan, you know, most of the time, right? And so we know what a healthy eating plan constitutes. So being a coach, once you get those main trouble spots out of the way, then being the coach to come back through and to think about, okay, well, what's next? Is it increased water or whatever the case may be, right? So there's always room for improvement, I think, even with our own diets. Yeah, I agree. When I'm when I'm listening, I'm just hearing sustainable. So like as if, as we're doing this to make sure that it's something that we can sustain as a lifestyle versus just a fad or just for a limited amount of time. Um, so I, I love that. So it's really good. Yeah, yeah that, any- that's awesome because it's really good to have in your toolkit as a coach a number of different strategies. And so there's a lot of buzz right now about around different eating plans. And we've been studying those as well here. For example, um, intermittent fasting, right? And that can take on a number of forms, whether you eat every other day or you eat some kind of type of fast every other day or five days a week and you fast for two. Or now one of the buzz um, diets is time-restricted eating. So only eating all your meals in certain windows throughout the day. and Again, it's just like a calorie is a calorie, right? A different style of eating or eating pattern may work for somebody, but not somebody else. But as a coach, it's important to have a lot of these things in your toolkit, especially when somebody might reach a plateau in their journey. So they got a lot of enthusiasm at the start. They change a few things. They're seeing some big wins. And let's just say I'm down five pounds and now I'm stuck and they're getting frustrated because they're tracking. And, you know, that's the time to sort of try to weave in a different strategy because it can get them over the hump and get the journey back on on track. And so, you know, time-restricted eating is a really cool way of thinking about it because the idea is that you eat all your calories in the earlier part of the day so that you, upon waking, you start eating between one to two hours after waking up, but then you eat all your calories within an eight hour window. And so that means if you're eating within eight hours, um, then you have a 16 hour fast, if you want to call it that, each day. And so what the studies show is that when you do that, you dig into your fat stores more substantially overnight. So we all dig into our fat stores overnight. That's our primary energy source when we sleep. But when you have an extended fasting period, you dig into the fat more. And then when you wake up, your body's more ready to welcome food. So you have an anticipatory response for food. So it means that naturally your insulin levels are already higher. And so that when you do eat, you're able to better metabolize the calories that you do eat. So there are a lot of benefits to thinking about the ways in which different eating patterns can can benefit people as well on their weight management journey. So as a coach, you've got to have lots of little tricks and tools up your sleeve to keep it fresh and to help people not get frustrated because they will. <laughs> 